I wish you luck in realizing your ambition. Hey everyone, it's Blue Lizard Jello, and welcome back to Everything Possible in Elden Ring. Last time, we finally, despite having seen it in the distance, we took out the Gatefront Ruins, and in doing so, we unlocked the build to change the Ashes of War, the skills on our weapons, and even the affinities, and we had a very long and hopefully productive conversation about that, and then we traveled to the first step, we took a look at the Church of Ella again, we made our way down to the beach, and we are here at the Coastal Cave, where Demi-Human Bach awaits in agony. We also saw the Nomadic Merchant. We're going to be returning there in just a second, but a few things to take care of first. Little housekeeping. As always, here are my stats. Pause it if you want to see it for any longer. And as for equipment, currently we have the broadsword and the longsword. That's right, we are going to be power stancing a bit here. We also have the torch. It is a little bit dark back there. Still have the Vagabond armor set without the helm. Right now, all I have is the Flask of Crimson Tears on my hotbar, and then on my pouch, Flask of Cerulean Tears, Lone Wolf Ashes, and the Spectral Steed Whistle. Now, a couple of things after I do a quick back step that I need to mention. So thank you so much for the comments on the previous videos and of course in Discord, hint hint nudge nudge, go ahead and join it if you want to talk to me offline. I've gotten some really good feedback about the video and a couple of critiques, which is perfectly acceptable. The first critique is I was asked if I purposefully didn't show off this telescope. If you remember from Aguil Lake North, we traveled down here and right around in this general area is where we found Bach, who had been turned into a tree. I didn't talk about the telescope. I actually did intend to, it's in my notes, and I forgot. But we're gonna be going back there for a very special event, if you will, so I will show it off. It's a cool feature. You can just use that telescope to get a bird's eye view of the surrounding area, and you actually can see enemies, which can be useful for kind of planning out your route. But we'll take a look at that very, very soon. There was one thing, however, that I failed to mention about the demi-humans. The demi-humans, wherever you find them, are more dangerous at night. And you can tell that they're more dangerous because their eyes will glow. Now that is not to be mistaken with the other type of glowing eyes that we'll see hopefully very soon, which indicates that that particular enemy will drop five times as many runes. So if you see an enemy with glowing eyes of that nature, it is definitely in your best interest to go and kill them. However, the demi-humans, when their eyes glow at night, it is because they are more aggressive. They are a nocturnal species and they are faster and more aggressive. Now they don't do any more damage. I did test this, the hits do the same amount. They don't give you any more runes. They are just more aggressive. They're more active at night. So you can see here over in the bottom right, with the little sundial looking thing. It is morning. And when I go and I approach the demi-humans, their eyes are not glowing. And in terms of aggression, yes, they will come and attack me, but they are certainly not really charging super fast. Their attacks aren't all too crazy. Their combos seem to come a little bit slow. Pretty easy to deal with. So let's go ahead and compare that to what they are like at night. So let me get away from them. I will have to go and rest at the side of grace here. Get the torch out, make it a little easier to see. There we have it. And now let's just pass the time until nightfall. And really, this is just a nice little feature. I like that they have this these differences in the day and night cycles, and it's not strictly certain bosses that appear, but it's actual enemies and, well, creatures that have different patterns, different behaviors. So you can see, number one, none of them are sleeping now. And their eyes are glowing, and they just become so much more aggressive. And while I haven't tested this, because I don't really have a way of doing so, they seem to just be faster in general but they are just all over you very, very quickly. Lots of yelling, which is pretty typical for them, but they definitely are a, just a bit more dangerous. What's really cool about this, however, isn't that just they're more dangerous, is that eventually, oh, what do we get? Rune fragment? But, well, eventually we're gonna get some spirit ashes that will allow us to have our very own, oh, rainbow stone, excellent. Rainbow Stone is something that we've already been able to craft, but basically we can use this to see if a ledge is survivable or not, kind of like Prism Stones of uh, previous. But with the Demi-Humans, we can get their Spirit Ashes, and their Ashes work the same as the actual creature themselves. In other words, if we use that Spirit Ash at night, they are more dangerous to our enemies, which is great. Now, I'm heading over here to the Nomadic Merchant because, well, I want this Smoldering Butterfly. 
and I want to get a Stanching Bolus, at least one. So Stanching Bolus, it's going to alleviate impending blood loss. The boss in the cave, the coastal cave that we just left, well, boss is because it's actually more than one. They are using Bloodstained Dagger, which does have bleed buildup, and we don't want to bleed during that boss fight. So it does cost 600 runes. You can see at the top we have 328. We, however, have several of these golden rune level one, so I'll just use, well, we'll just use two of them. I'm just gonna buy one for now. There we have it. Well done. And now, let's go ahead and hop on Torrent and let's go take on that cave. The other thing we're gonna wanna do though is put the bolus on either a hotbar or I suggest your item pouch. Something you don't need all the time, but you will have it if the need arises. Right, so I will go ahead and rest here to get our last little bit of health left. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the Ash of War on the broadsword. So this is my left hand, and I'm going to use the Storm Stomp. So this is just going to provide that little bit of stun if I need it. I'm not going to change the affinity though, because if you can see, it will change it from 117 plus 15. That's our attack power on the left. That's our standard. So that is 132. It would reduce it to 100 plus 20, which is 120. So a loss right now of 12 points because we don't have high enough strength and dex in order to make quality worthwhile. So let's put that back on. I know I had already put that on the halberd, but. And now, if we want to use that, we do need to two hand it, okay? But if we switch over to our long sword and we're power stance, I do get the Ash of War, the skill, from my right hand weapon. All right, let's get a little bit of sneak going on. We have some cave moss up here that we've picked up before. So we'll get this kill here, and let's just take a look at our surroundings. Grab the cave moss. We have one small demi-human there. We also have a much larger one with a spiked large club there. And there's a few more down and around. But as long as we are quiet, we don't have to fight them all at once. In fact, even though we have a torch out, we can actually get a little bit of sneak going. There we go. More cave moss. Ooh, more rainbow stones and a rune fragment. Crouching down yet again. We do have... Oh, and no, okay, he saw me right away. Normally he doesn't, and I can get a backstab on him. That's okay. Wait for him to come here. Just a couple of R1s. And how about a... Well, I was going to try and get fancy with a backstab R1. There we go, beautiful. Now these two have not engaged though, so I'm going to go for the big one first, just to get him out of the way. He's not quite dead though, with that backstab, now he is, perfect. Grab the cave boss, and over here, we have land octopus ovary, we got those from killing the land octopus, the land octopus before, but now we have our first NPC summon, and that's because even though there's no fog wall here, that is going to be the boss of this cave. Bosses, plural. And not only is there more than one boss, but the bosses also have ads. We are about to fight two demi-human chiefs. This fight can get out of control very quickly. If you're struggling with it, or if you just don't want to go up against that kind of challenge, what I recommend is summoning Old Knight Isvan, who is clad with the Dismounter with the Gravitas Ash of War. We haven't seen that, but we're actually gonna be getting that soon. He can do incredibly well. I did some tests and he can nearly solo this fight. He can at least get one of the chiefs down and get the other one down to about 75% before he dies without any intervention whatsoever. But if you couple Isfin with, oh, wrong button, your spirit wolves, they can do a number in this fight even if you don't lend any assistance. If you do help out, well, that much better this fight will go. Now what I'm gonna do though, is I'm gonna put the stanching boluses on my item pouch just in case I do need it. And I am actually gonna do this solo. I'm not gonna go in with this, and I'm not gonna go in with my spirit wolf. And that's because, well number one, I wanna show a lot of these fights off on my own to show that it is possible. And to, I guess, prove to myself that I can do it. Hopefully I can do it. But in this fight, if you go in, as soon as you drop down, you're kind of in the boss encounter. The fog wall is going to go up, you can't back out, and you're gonna see some demi-humans start to creep around these rock formations right here. But over here, you can see that there is some vegetation. If we go in there and crouch, we can actually sneak around that rock formation, and we can wait for the demi-humans to be in a place where we can attack them, and even if we wanted to get a sneak attack 
on one of the bosses who'll be sleeping over there. The problem is, as soon as we engage them, we are going to have several demi-humans in this area and the demi-human chief, and then over beyond, back further in the cave, there's another demi-human chief and adds with him as well. My goal is to take down the demi-humans, then this demi-human chief, then the demi-humans back there, and then the last demi-human chief. That's the plan, we'll see how we do. First, however, they are weak to fire, so I'm gonna craft four of these fire pots, and I'm going to put those right on my hot bar, just like so. Perfect. I might even, I think I'm going to, I'm going to actually use my kukris for this, just to see once we get further back in the cave, we should be able to pull, if not kill, a couple of the small ones before the demi-human chief even gets close to us. So that's the plan. So right away, we're gonna drop down in. Oh, I should mention with Old Knight Ispen, he's only gonna be there if he's still alive. There actually is a quest later on to kill him, and if you've done that, his sign will not appear there. So you can see these demi-humans that are just patrolling. That's fine, let's loop around. There is the sleeping chief. Don't want to get spotted here. There we go. So there is one here. There's another one who patrols all the way back there. You also have this one leaning up against the rock. There is the chief right there. The other chief is way down there. I don't want to use my telescope because it will cause me to stand up. But you can also see that there are a number of demi-humans back there. As long as we keep this fight right around this rock formation then we're going to be fine and we won't get their attention. If we do go into that water though, kind of where that demi-human is right now, everyone's going to be alert and we're going to be in a lot of trouble. So the goal here is to very quickly dispatch the small ones. In fact, if I can get a fire bomb or a fire pot to get splash damage on two of these, that would be perfect. Here we go. Okay, we got two. So even though we have two health bars, we don't have to worry about the other one as long as we can stick back here. That's perfect. And now, let's talk about some of these attacks. That one right there is going to be your best chance to attack because his daggers actually get stuck in the ground. And I'm out of stamina, which is silly. Definitely need to heal up. Watch the bites. Okay, heal up. Get a couple of free hits there because he got stuck in the ground. Fire pot. Good damage there. Okay, I was a little bit too close. Okay, let's see if we can stun him. And might be able to finish him here, just about. Okay, so that's one chief down, not, not the finest fight. So that is essentially how we're gonna do that. You saw my blood meter building up. If I got any further, I might have been tempted not to jump, but to use my standing bolus. But now, first off, let's grab some silver fireflies over here. Even though the music is intense, no one else actually knows we're here yet. So what I'm going to do is just get close enough to try and kill these two. So one here and one there with my cougars. Okay, that's good. So now there's two more. We have the chief coming this way though. Go ahead and get a fire pot going on him. And if we just run backwards, there we go, another fire pot. Good damage. Okay, so if he's gonna do this, I am going to go for the attacks. The other demi humans are nowhere near us, which is perfect. Because I want to show if we do kill him, then watch what happens to the other demi humans that's gonna hit. Okay, he's gonna roar. Anytime he roars, good opportunity to heal. All right, the other ones are getting close, but that's all right, we almost have him dead. And I think we can finish. There we go. Demi Human Chief's done, and as soon as they are done, we get the tailoring tools and the sewing needle, and the Demi Humans cower. Whenever there is a leader among them, once the leader is dead, they want nothing more to do with you. But we got the tailoring tools and the sewing needle. The tailoring tools is gonna to open up another option in the menu of the Sites of Grace. It allows us to alter our clothes. Altering clothes, it is very limited to what you can do. In fact, typically, it just means removing the cape. And in doing so, it will slightly alter, or actually decrease, 
your defenses. And we'll take a look at that here in a second. I'm actually gonna remove the cape of the Vagabond set because I like the way it looks and it does slightly reduce the weight. I believe that this chest piece goes down by one weight unit, which can be the difference between a medium roll and a heavy roll if you want a talisman on. Eventually, we're gonna be able to do this for free, but for now it does cost runes. The sewing needle, however, if we take a look at the sewing needle, it's in our key items here. A large sewing needle curved like a fang. Bok, the demi-human's prized possession. We want to bring this to Bok. He's not in a good place, but if we bring this back to him, maybe it can lift his spirits. Right, well, you might be friendly to me now, but I am not friendly to you. So the other one is way over there by his fire. He never even made it. Again, what I just did was definitely not the easiest way to do that fight. Summoning Knight Ispen and using your spirit wolves is a great way to make mincemeat of those those chiefs. And the bloodstained dagger that they're using, we can't get it from them, but we do have some opportunity to farm that at a later time. Okay, another damage here, along with the smoldering butterfly, good for our fire pots. A couple more easy demi-human kills, and then, instead of going back to the beginning, grab some more cave boss, we're running all the way to the back of the cave, and we're exiting on this island that we saw directly across from Coastal Cave. There's Coastal Cave, there's the rocks, actually you can see one of the demi-humans, there is the archway that had the nomadic merchant underneath. And up here at the top of the hill, once we get to the site of grace here, we'll rest up. We have the Church of Dragon Communion. So we're gonna go take a look at the church. We're gonna get a few goodies scattered around the island and take a look at what we can do inside here at the altar. But first, let's look at altering our garment. So the Vagabond Knight Armor, it's a weight of 10.6. You can see a physical damage negation of 13.5. Just to show you, I'm looking at these two numbers right here. But then if we go down to alter it, you can see that it goes down to 9.6, so it does get reduced, and the physical damage negation does go down ever so slightly. In fact, everything goes down ever so slightly. It does cost 500 runes, but because of that weight difference, I'm actually going to do it, because it, like I said, it could be the difference between the whether or not I can wear a talisman. Occasionally, out in the wild, so to speak, you will get armor drops that are already altered. You can see in parentheses at the name, at the end of the name, it says altered. That means that it's already been altered and we can go back to it if we want, but we do have to pay another 500 runes. But there we go. And I think, I like it. I actually like the way this looks. So we can see here the leaves of the earth tree are falling yet again. Pretty cool. So we're gonna get bonus rune acquisition. Not that we're gonna be fighting anything right now. But here is the Church of Dragon Communion, and over here at this altar, we can perform a Ritual of Dragon Communion. We don't have anything required in order to get these incantations, but these are dragon hearts. As we kill dragons, we will obtain dragon hearts, and then we can use them here at the Church of Dragon Communion or the Cathedral of Dragon Communion, which is much further on, to get incantations like Dragon Fire, Dragon Claw, Dragon Maw. Unfortunately, most of the dragon incantations are a bit on the weak side, especially given that you do need both faith and arcane. Dragon Maw, 24 faith, 16 arcane. That's quite the investment for something that frankly is a little bit lackluster. But you can always go through and read exactly how it works and whether or not it can be charged or if there's a follow-up attack. For example, Dragon Claw does have a follow-up. Transforms caster into a dragon to bite the enemy before them. They're fun, but they're not super great. They're not super great. And as we kill dragons, we're gonna open up more incantations, most of which are only gonna be accessible at the Cathedral of Dragon Communion later on. Okay, so what time is it? It is night, so if we go back here, there are some mushrooms. This creature right here, completely harmless because they are, well, they're currently blue. If they're red, however, they're going to be aggressive. These are spirit jellyfish. I'm not gonna talk about what or who these spirit jellyfish may have been in just yet. We'll talk about that more when we get some information about these. Uh, if you want to attack them, you can. They can drop Grave Glovewort, which is an item that we can use to upgrade our spirit ashes. 
but you can get those very easily later on, so I don't recommend it. I am gonna show though, however, once you attack them once, then they turn red and they are angry and they can do some really, really nasty things. Not just these physical attacks, but let's see if we can actually get him to spit poison. There's a little headbutt. Usually when there's a little bit of distance, they'll do it. Here, there we have it. Look at that nasty, nasty poison buildup. So at this point, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to just kill the spirit jellyfish. The other thing though, is that the aggression seems to be contagious. There's another jellyfish that's just over there. Fortunately, he wasn't close enough, but if they're in close proximity, they will all become aggressive and that can become very dangerous. Some of them naturally will be aggressive, so just keep that in mind. If they are red, you may want to give them some distance. So now we're going to hop up here. We're going to skyrim our way up to the top of this pillar. Yes, I could be using torrent. But over here, we have a developer message. Far to the east, you'll find the Cathedral of Dragon Communion, a place where draconic power gathers. As I mentioned, there is another church, well, rather a cathedral, and it is due east from here. Well, we don't have a whole lot east of here, so it's gonna be a little bit before we can actually get there. Before we hop down from this rubble, though, make sure that we head on over to this shiny, because we get our very first Exalted Flesh. This is something we're going to be crafting a lot of and using quite a lot of because Exalted Flesh is a consumable that gives you an extra 20% physical damage against your enemies for 30 seconds. Don't be like this one YouTuber that I watched and one YouTuber that I actually was that thought it was 20% damage increase across the board because I used to use this before every boss fight even though I was only casting sorceries. So, shame on me. Now you can hear the little twinkling sound. There is a teardrop scarab down here. I can see a glowing skull down there. But before we go that way, let's actually head over to where that one ram is over there. By the way, the ram, similar to the boars, the rams, the males of the sheep, are aggressive. They will actually attack you. Let's see if I can get him to do so. I just, I like this. I like this little feature here. Yep, there we go. He's going to headbutt us. But unfortunately, he's got to go. Let's heal up a little bit. Little Jerboa here. Look back behind this vegetation, we have four great dragonfly heads. It can be a royal pain to farm those dragonflies, or Dobson flies as we now know, but you can get four of them for free here on this corpse. These birds here, the ones that I mentioned, drop the foul feet a lot more frequently, which is true, I have done that test. They is much more frequent than the eagles. These are actually a real life bird called a guillemot. A Gillimot, it's a seabird in the family Alcidae or Alcidae, I'm not really sure which pronunciation is correct. Uh, they actually are related to penguins, but these didn't lose the ability to fly. Just a fun little bit of trivia for you. There we go. Foul foot, five pinions, perfect. Okay, now we're just going to follow these rocks along to the back. Not forgetting about our friend Bach, we will be returning. Some rawa raisin over there. We do have a mushroom right here. Oh, I see that glowing skull. Let's grab that. 200 runes. Even in late game, I will pick those up. I find them to be incredibly valuable. There we have it. And there is the teardrop scarab. Jump attack on there. We get the kill and we get our first somber smithing stone. So somber smithing stone. This is the smithing stone for the rare or the unique weapons. Some weapons, most weapons, will upgrade using regular smithing stones. Certain other ones will require these sombers. For the regular smithing stones, if an item requires that, like my longsword or the broadsword, then you will actually go all the way up to 25 upgrades. You can get plus 25 on these weapons, whereas these somber weapons can only go up to plus 10. The nice thing is, for the regular weapons, in order to go up a level, it's two stones, and then it's four stones, then it's six stones. Then it goes back down to two stones, then four, then six, but at a higher level. Rinse and repeat up till 25 when you use a special stone to get to 25. For the somber weapons, you only need one of each level to improve that item. So to get to the first upgrade, it's one level one, then it's one level two, etc. So a lot easier to manage that way. Okay, some more guillemots down here. Might as well take the time to try and get some more foul feet. How'd we do? Okay, another foul foot and two more flight pinions. And then over here, 
we have a smithing stone level two. So the smithing stone level two, of course, that is going to be for levels four, five, and six. One, two, and three, of course, are going to be just the regular smithing stones. The problem is, well, we can't actually do that upgrade. In order to go beyond the plus three upgrade, we need someone who's more experienced in smithing than we are. So it's going to be a little bit before we get there, but for those of you who are already in the know, once you get to Roundtable Hold, which is the hub, then you will be able to get those upgrades from Blacksmith Hugh. So just one more little thing I want to show here. It's nothing too super important, but if we just loop around here, back towards the cave where we started, and we're just going to hug these walls. Yes, I could be killing the Guillemots, but as soon as I can drop down, I will do so because we have a single tarnished golden sunflower. Absolutely unnecessary because we have the three right by the first step that we can collect, but I do like to grab them for the holy bot. So we can run back through the cave or since we killed the boss and we're outside of the cave, we can now fast travel. So let's go back to the coastal cave. And here is poor despondent box. So let's hurry talk to him and give him that sewing needle. Oh, wait. Is that what I think it is? You got it back for me. My sewing needle. <sighs> what made you go and do a thing like that? My mum was a seamstress, and that sewing kit was... All I had to remember her by, I always wanted to be just like sweet old mum. Then I s suppose I, I can't just curl up and die, can I? So Bach has a somewhat lengthy quest, or at least it's going to take the majority of the game to see it to the end. But it is his quest line that will eventually allow us to alter our equipment for free. So a nice little perk, plus it's Bach. And, well... He's beautiful. Thank you. You're very kind. I will. Then I see. With the time that we have remaining, let's go tackle one more little mini dungeon delve, and that would be our first catacombs. Remember, we activated the Statue of Roses here, which is pointing up in the northwest direction right around here. That's where we're going to head. So let's first travel to the Church of Ella. And from here, I am going to just hop on Torrent. Remember, that is where we can upgrade. At this point, we do have the ability to upgrade. If we take a look, we have four smithing stone level one. So that would be one level one upgrade, or we could do two separate weapons with level ones. It's not enough to get to a plus two, but if you wanted to get a little bit more damage, you can. I'm actually going to save those for now. Instead, we're just going to ride around here. There's the pond back there with the land squirts and of course the great dragonflies. There's the Statue of Roses pointing in this direction. So I'm going to ride over these ruins, pick up any ruin fragments that I can see. Just like to have them. I think I just missed one. We do have some herbs here that we can pick up, some earthly flowers. Now these enemies right here, a lot of people run right past them. And frankly, there's, there's good reason for that, especially if he's just going to hit me with a torch. But why these groups of enemies exist, and you're going to see these periodically, is that the developers have put small groups of weak enemies in strategic locations to fill your flask. So if I run in here and I take some damage because he's hitting me with his torch, let's just go ahead and get some kills. Oh, look at that. We got an aristocrat garb that's already been altered, just like we just talked about. But if I use my Flask of Crimson Tears, of course, I probably should have waited because he is going to hit me. There we go. And we get our Flask back. So they put these groups of enemies in areas so that when you kill the entire group, you get that Flask back, which is really nice. But here is our first catacomb, the Stormfoot Catacombs. Let's rest at this side of grace. And unfortunately, I just had a look, and actually we can't alter the aristocrat garbs. There are different levels of alterations, so if you notice that a piece of armor can't be altered, chances are you just don't have the item yet that you'll need in order to alter that particular item. 
Now, let's go talk to this ghost and we'll talk about the upcoming catacomb. A proper death means returning to the Erd Tree. Have patience until the time comes and the roots call for you. So we're already starting to hear about proper death and the roots of the Earth Tree and proper death and undead going to be a recurring topic that we bring up again and again. So just keep that in the back of your mind. A proper death means returning to the Earth Tree. Now we have the first enemy in this catacomb. In fact, all we have are these enemies and then the boss hiding behind that chair. That is an imp. If you started with the feigned imp ashes, this is what you would be summoning at this point. The feigned imp ashes are excellent early game ashes, but these enemies are excellent early game enemies. And by excellent, I mean terrible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to not roll towards them. I need to adjust my loadout. These enemies are very resistant to piercing and to slashing damage, which unfortunately is exactly what these do, standard and pierce damage. My club and my torch, however, both do strike damage. I had us grab the torch for only 200 runes because one, it's nice to light up the areas, but two, it is a very cheap early game strike weapon and we can use it just like any other weapon. In fact, we're gonna start out by doing just, yeah, just that. So I'm gonna put on the torch and then I'll put on the club so you can see the difference in the power. And then I'm gonna put on my heater shield. We are gonna be focusing on some guard counters in this catacomb. I'm also though going to put on my short bow. The short bow is going to come into play a little bit later, but we do need some arrows, so let's craft some bone arrow fletched. We could do the firebone arrows, but for what we need it for, really unnecessary, so let's do the bone arrow fletched. There we have it. And let's clear these from our inventory since we don't actually have any on us anyway. Now, there are traps and there are ambushes all over the place. And anytime you see a room in a catacomb with a shiny or an enemy who's just standing there in the back, you can rest assured that probably there's another one waiting for you. So let's get this one to come at us. He's using a four catchet. So you can see doing some decent damage with the torch. And we did that guard counter. We didn't take any physical damage, but we did get some bleed buildup. And we didn't get the knockdown. The staggered damage from the torch is just not very high. Compare that, however, to a club, and just a single guard counter is enough to take the imp down to his knees for us to get the critical. So, very cheap early game option. Slightly more expensive, but much more effective. And we get our root resin again, which is very nice for that fire grease and other types of weapon buffs later on. Down in the next level, over here we get our first Grave Glove Wart level one. This is for upgrading those spirit summons, as I mentioned when we were talking with the spirit jellyfish. In the catacombs, you'll get plenty of grave and ghost glove work. Over here, we have a heavy door locked by some contraption. Make sure you cancel that message. Here's the summoning pool for the catacomb. And now, let's take a look and see what we have here. We have one imp there by a statue. We have another one there who has now already seen us. This room can get a little bit hectic, so what I like to do is to actually not get my torch out, but to get my short bow out. Okay, that's the barrage, so that is the weapon skill. So I got his attention, let's just back up, let him come to us, guard counter. Oh, stairs does make it a little bit more difficult. Let's, let's see if we can get kind of level with him. Do it. There we have it. But notice that bleed meter is still building up. We still have that stanchion bolus if we need it. So now let's do this again, but this time let's actually do a manual aim. So what I did there was I knocked an arrow by holding in R1, and then I hit L1, and now I have this reticle, and I can zoom in just a little bit using the D-pad. Let's get a headshot on him. You can actually see it does make a slightly different sound when that happens and hopefully he'll drop down even though he's up there just throwing his throwing daggers at us their throwing daggers by the way are unique they're different than the ones we get because theirs do cause bleed buildup and ours do not okay it looks like he's content to just staying up there and that's fine let's go over here let's grab a gray violet 
So the Grey Violet, oh, he actually might drop down here. The Grey Violet is actually only used for a single item, and that's a Rancor Pot that we won't have the recipe for for quite some time. There's more Grave Glovewort. We will be heading up there to deal with him in a moment. But right here, this trap right here, this tower that you can see for just a moment before the fire starts again, this is why we brought the short bow. With the short bow, I'm gonna do the manual aim again, so I'm gonna knock an arrow. <laughs> I'm gonna L1 to two hand. I'm gonna R1 to knock an arrow, and then L1 to aim again. And then just fire it down there. And the tower goes down. Any attack or any movement, even jumping on it, will cause those pillars to move up and down. There are puzzles associated with these later on, so keep them in mind. There's even an item, and I'm not gonna tell you what it is just yet, but that we can purchase from a merchant in a little bit that can activate those from a very huge distance away. They, that item can even activate illusory walls, which do exist in Elden Ring. But we have this imp here. Let's go ahead. What I like to do instead of using an arrow is just run under him and then run out. He's going to eventually drop as if we're still there. And let's just get up there and get a guard counter. Get the critical. Easy enough. And we have another statue here. So let's deal with that before we move on. So two hand knock. Free aim. And we can see some imps hiding over there. We'll be dealing with them shortly. But over here, we get a wonderful little item. The Prattling Pate Hello. That's right, the talking headstones are back. This one in particular says hello. There's no information though on who Prattling Pate is or was. And that's a shame. I wish there was some lore about it. Just says, twisted clay sculpt in the shape of a human head. A wistful fetish that imparts voices and words on an eternal journey. It's pretty great though. It's pretty great. But just to show you that even just jumping on here will activate it. You can see that. And then if I just give it a whack with the torch, go right back down. But we're actually gonna use that to our advantage here in just a second because, first off, the way up is with that ladder right there. We have the item just over there and we have one, two, three, four, five imps. We have five imps. You can pull them one at a time using your bow or using your throwing daggers or your, your bone arrows, your bone darts. Or you can do something that was suggested to me during a live stream that I was doing recently on the Everything Possible preparation. And that is this. You run, get them all aggroed, and then carefully jump on the pillar. Get your shield up because they might start throwing fire bombs at you. Yep, there's a little, little bit of damage there, but it's all right. I can block most of it. And as long as they decide to play ball with me. There we go. Okay. We got two more here that are being stubborn. Let's just try to move around a little bit. Maybe that'll get them. Tell you what, let's craft some bone darts. Maybe just a little bit of damage will get them to... Oh, that one's moving. Stay right there. Okay. And I believe we still have one more. Yep, right there. And I can't even get him. That's okay. I'll tell you what. Let's just get him with a jumping... I'm not even mad about that. I just sat here dumbfounded that I, I did that. And, well, that's the level of expertise you've come to expect from everything possible. So, uh, you're welcome. Not only that, but now the imps have seen just how frail and fragile I am. And they're going to take it easy on me out of pity. That's right. Enemies do like to engage in the pity system in Elden Ring. But anyway, this also gives me an opportunity to show you what happens when you die. Once again, obviously completely planned out. When you die, your runes will drop approximately where you die. There is a bit of a lag time and it can't put them in certain areas. But when you die, you will find these little branches of the earth tree on the ground and go and engage with those and that will give you your runes back. But I have to do this again because frankly, I need to redeem myself and we need to get these items. So once again, get the aggro, get up here with our shield up. Hopefully more of them will actually stay in front this time. 
Okay. That's good. Let's keep it going. Oh. Now they're being truly stubborn. And the problem is, if I try and attack them with anything meaningful, it is going to cause the pillars to... It's going to cause the pillar to go down. Okay. Alright. One left. Now. <laughs> Let's do this a little bit differently. Guard counter. Much better. But hey, if that wasn't entertaining, honestly, I'm not even sure what is. Alright, let's make that safe to go back. And then over here, we have Smoldering Butterflies. And we have Ghost Glove Wart Level 1. This is not Grave Glove Wart, this is Ghost Glove Wart. The difference being, this allows you to upgrade your rare or unique Spirit Ashes. Grave is your standard, Ghost is your unique. This is the difference between Smithing Stones and Sombering Smithing Stones. All right, a little bit more to explore. Let's run back down to the ladder. Straight ahead, we have one imp there, and of course that means there's another one waiting right here, so I'm just going to go in with the charge R2. Knock him down, get the critical. Well, almost got the critical. There's some more grave glove work. Don't really want you falling down, because there is another imp over there. So that works. Knock him down. Perfect. What I want to show off, though, is that, number one, these enemies can drop their fanged hatchet, or their forked hatchet, rather, very readily, which is a nice little early game bleed weapon. But what I want to show is that you can actually get the guard counter even from a projectile like that. So even though that was kind of useless, I just want to show it off. If they're throwing their daggers at you, or if you get hit with an arrow, you can still get the guard counter have that. Perfect. One more imp in the other room. Let's just charge at him. Guard counter. We will be switching up the tactics here, but guard counter early game is such a great and safe way of dealing with your foes. So, another grave glove warp, but over here we have the wandering noble ashes. These aren't great. But they're not terrible. The Wandering Noble Ashes, they only cost 28 FP, so pretty cheap. You get five Wandering Nobles, three of them with swords, two of them with torches. They're very weak, but they can do a good job at distracting. And once you upgrade them, they can last a little bit. Keep in mind, however, the Noble Ashes, and we're about to pick up another one, are afraid of certain enemy types. And uh, you, you'll see that. You'll see that here soon enough. So now we're going back to the room where we saw the statue and the couple of imps. So we're going to drop down, but get your shield up just in case the other imps are here. It looks like we're just waiting on this one right here to wake up. Perfect. Hey, and what do we get? Oh, smithing stone level one. Even better. Not a very common drop from them, but it is something if you want to farm the catacombs for some smithing stones, you certainly could. Another grave glove wart. And here is the lever. Every catacomb is going to have a lever for you to look for. And that lever is going to open up that heavy door. Remember, once there is a prompt up on your screen, you can't do anything until you've cleared that message. Okay. I do want to deal with at least one of these imps before we try to go to the door. Come on, attack. And unfortunately, I didn't actually get the deflect. There we have it. That way we can deal with them and go into the door and talk about the boss before we actually go in. And again, please. Oh boy, you are being stubborn. There we go. Missed the critical. That's alright, we can grab another Grey Violet because that did respawn due to our <clears throat> untimely demise. So the door is open. And we do have a fog wall right there. Now, for me, because I got hit, instead of healing and only going in with two heals, I'm going to back up. And I'm going to back up because oftentimes with the catacombs, you have a rather straight shot to the boss. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rest here. Yes, all the enemies I kill are going to respawn, but that's all right because we can go straight to the boss. But we have some runes now, and I think it's time we upgraded just ever so slightly. So... Vigor is always a really good option early game. You can see we have enough for two levels. I'm going to put one point into Vigor and one point into Dexterity. I want to get my Dexterity up so I can use more weapons. We have the Flail, 
which requires 18 dexterity. There's another weapon we'll get soon that requires 18 dexterity, so that wouldn't be a bad option. We do want to get our faith to 12 soon as well, so we can use faith, so we can use healing incantations once we get there. But for now, I think one point vigor, one point dexterity is going to be a very good option. This boss is a weird one. This boss is not overly dangerous, but this boss is a bit creepy. This boss is pretty much a statue, and we're gonna have to deal with it with strike weapons, just like we have been previously. But you gotta keep in mind that this thing has no sense looking or acting the way that it does. We're gonna be talking a little bit about strategy in here, but mostly what we're gonna be trying to do, we're gonna try and break its stance so we can get a critical. So this is the Earth Tree Barrier Watchdog. It can do this little plunging attack, and when it gets close, you really do need to dodge kind of late, and typically we'll do three of those. Here when it's standing up like that, it's gonna walk at you and try and do that big slash overhead. There's the plunge. Yeah, see, I dodged a little bit too early, meaning I took some damage there. There's the stab attack. A lot of stamina damage there. You can absolutely get guard counters on this enemy. It's unfortunately not really weak to anything but strike damage, so don't focus on fire pots or arrows or anything like that. You can bring your summons in, as you can see here. And if you get behind him, which is something I do want to show, he will actually use, oh, going for four. That's a bit unusual. All right, I'm gonna try and bait this attack and then get behind him if I can. I want him to use his tail. And he's not doing it. Okay, there's the thrust attack. So not too many people have seen that because he can actually slam his tail down and do that little bit of an explosion. The other one that he has is a flame breath. The flame breath is actually a really good one to punish because that will allow you to kind of circle around and get some attacks. Okay, enough talking. Time to use my barbaric roar. Gonna get my shield back up though. Doesn't matter if he hits behind it though. All right. Get him to drop that sword. A couple of free hits. Okay, big slash attacks. Back up. There's a guard counter on that thrust. Okay, here's the flame attack. If you're careful and you sprint around him, you can get an attack and then you can keep circling around. Okay, big slash there. And there is the guard counter for the stance break. Good damn, I am gonna heal up to be safe. Okay, let's get back up there. This is also a really good fight to talk about your stamina management with your shield. So notice, that if I'm going to take an attack on the shield, then what I'm also gonna do is wait to use that shield again until I've gotten some stamina back. So I'll try and demonstrate that. So here's one hit, I put the shield down, get the shield back up. Otherwise, we're gonna have our stamina broken pretty quickly. Back up. Okay, let him do his slam. Oh, missed that guard counter, unfortunately. Okay, fire attack, good. My barbaric roar has run out. Okay, just about have him. And tell you what, just for style points, let's completely miss him while he's in the air. And there we have it, the Earth Tree Burial Watchdog. Uh, kind of fun to play with, really good for practicing a few techniques like guard counters and stamina management with your shield, uh, and just dodge timings, because dodge timings can be a little bit strange. But we get the Noble Sorcerer Ashes. Slightly better, slightly worse than the Wandering Nobles. You can decide. It is very cheap. It's only 11 FP to summon, but you only get a single Noble Sorcerer, and it's very weak. I have no good uses for the Noble Sorcerer. If I guess if you just want one single bit of cannon fodder and you have very little FP, maybe this is the Spirit Summon for you. Otherwise, there are loads of better options out there for you. 
Now that we have killed the boss in this area and everything is dead, I'm going to be traveling to Agil Lake North, just southeast of the Gatefront Ruins. And on that note, I'm going to say thank you all so much for watching. That is going to do it for this episode of Everything Possible in Elden Ring. Next time, we have some exciting things planned because we are finally going to be getting enough materials, some enough smithing materials to start upgrading our equipment. And that's going to be a really good time. So I hope you join me then. If you learned something, please leave me a comment down below. Let me know what you learned. And if I missed something or if you have another tip or trick or a better strategy for either the Demi-Human Chiefs or the Erdtree Burial Watchdog, let me know that too down in the comments below so we can all keep learning. But I want to thank you all so much for watching. And I will see you next time.